Hi, my name is Matt Montgomery and I'm part of the agronomic team here in the central and west central part of Illinois for Pioneer and today we're going to talk about the reproductive period in corn and we're going to use that basic information as a backdrop to better think about managing silk clipping insect pests. So let's start out with some of the real basic stuff. How big? How big are we talking about? If we think about the average pollen grain, how big is that grain of pollen? How big is that little packet of male genetic material that we want to get in contact with a silk to establish a kernel? Well, if you took a human hair and you put it under a microscope and you measured its diameter, its width, you would find that a human hair is about 50 microns wide. If you and I then went out and canvassed the countryside and looked at various native grasses that we might run into and the pollen produced by those grasses, you and I would find that most of those pollen grains are about a quarter of the width of a human hair or maybe they're about the same size, same width as a human hair. Pollen grains for corn are larger. If you took two human hairs and put them side by side and you measured them across, that's about 100 microns and that's about the width, about the diameter of a grain of corn pollen. Now that means a lot of that pollen falls in proximity to the plant, maybe within a couple dozen feet and maybe 95 plus percent of that pollen. But a certain fraction of that and a fairly sizable fraction of that can move long distances, especially if we get just a little bit of wind behind that. We're talking about a couple hundred feet to a few hundred feet to several hundred feet that that pollen is able to move around sometimes even fractions of a mile in some cases for that pollen to move around. Now the plant produces a lot of pollen to begin with. The exact number is kind of hard to pin down. There are all sorts of different thoughts on this topic but think about the number 2 million as being kind of accepted by most people. Some of the more liberal estimates go up to 5 million plus, and some of those other estimates may talk about a number that falls just shy of 1 million. The point is, there's a lot of pollen produced by this plant, and there's a lot of pollen produced if you compare it to these silks that are right here. The average silk, if you compare the number of pollen grains per silk, we're talking about a few thousand pollen grains produced per silk to really get this business going. The plant is trying to stack as much in its favor of getting pollen in contact with silk as possible. It's trying to minimize its own risk of that important process going awry. So what happens after that pollen lands on a silk? What are we going to see? Well, within a few to several hours of that pollen grain, that male packet of genetic material, landing on the silk, we'll see a little peg come out and we'll see an infection basically of the silk occur by that pollen grain. It will shoot out a tube, a pollen tube, that will go down the length of that silk and it will eventually penetrate the ovule and establish a kernel about 24 hours later. Now once it does that, it's going to form a small embryonic plant, basically a small version of what you see behind me if we for some crazy reason would decide to plant that kernel. And we're also going to establish the beginnings of all that goody, all that starchy stuff that's going to feed that little primordial plant if it would decide to go on. We're going to use that stuff for food, of course. Now once that kernel is established, once the ovule has been fertilized, we'll see that silk pinch off within a few to several hours of that occurring. And that becomes a great way for you and I to gauge the progress of ear development. How many kernels do we actually have established on this plant? We also know that these pollen grains are really high in moisture. We're talking about 60% of the weight of that pollen grain, these little tiny microscopic or nearly microscopic billiard balls, being moisture, being H2O. There are some ways we can mess up this process. One of those ways would be 100 degree plus temperatures for days and days and days on end. This hardly ever happens, but when that happens, we run a risk of that moisture content dropping down to 40%, basically making those pollen grains unviable and resulting in sterile pollen 
the inability to fertilize that ear to get those kernels established. We call that tassel blasting. Pretty rare. What happens more often than not is we wind up with a disruption in nick or silking, that synchronization between pollen shed and silk development in really drought prone periods. These silks are cranked out by moisture pressure, by water pressure, and if we're running short on that, instead of these coming out at the rate of about an inch per day, we see that back off significantly and we can have pollen shed occur when we don't have silks present. That's really the reason we saw a lot of yield loss in years like 2012, 2013 maybe in some cases, that kind of thing. So how can we use this to really manage silk clipping insect pests better? You know, there are all sorts of great thresholds um, kind of mentioned in literature about how many insects you might get worried about on these ears, how much you might get worried about these silks getting clipped off and not allowing kernel establishment to happen. Those are great thresholds for giving us some kind of perspective on the relative population of insects that we might be encountering. The real big deal though is how far along is this ear? In some ways, it's not so much the number of insects that are an issue, it's how far along is that ear when we have those insects appear. And we can easily gauge that by shucking this ear, shaking that ear, and seeing how many of the silks fall away. Each one of those silks that fall away is an established kernel, and we can visually estimate how far along we are. If I get about three quarters of that ear established, I feel really good for where I'm at, and I'm probably becoming much less anxious about silk clipping insect pests. So you'll notice on this ear right here, we're about three quarters established. But if I'm not to three quarters of the ear and silk clipping insect pests like rootworm or Japanese beetle or some of those things come in and then I see them start clipping off ears and that's widely distributed throughout the field, I might become more anxious and I might need to do something to manage those silk clipping pests. We have a very narrow window period of time to get this pollination, this kernel establishment right. And if we miss that, it can have dramatic impact on yield that some of us have seen, unfortunately, from time to time. That's just one example of many different things we can do with a little bit of information about plant growth and development, how we can use it to fine tune our management and maybe spend our dollars more wisely. I look forward to visiting with you more in the future and thank you very much for watching this segment. That concludes this Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy video podcast. Visit our page on pioneer.com and follow us on Twitter and Facebook for more agronomy insights.